But these three people made lasting impact. That means the impact for another made, we are still enjoying after retired, after retired for almost 30 years ago retired. Similarly, Korean, the operation fund is started, led to the so-called milk self-sufficiency. And today we are proud to say that we are number one in the country. Why? Similarly, Sri Dharan's metro. I mean, nobody ever thought that, you know, from, you can build a train from uh, Goa to Mumbai in such a, without any foreign help. And also the Delhi metro and then which led to a spin-off effect of so many metros across the country. So in 10 years time, there is total transformation. So that is the, you know, impact somebody can make if somebody is visionary, somebody has leadership qualities, somebody can understand the problem and somebody knows how to proceed. Because these people also work with all the constraints we are also facing. They also have financial constraints, they also have, you know, manpower, everything, but still they achieve because of the, you know, the leadership and the vision. So having said the, about the important of uh, human capital, then the issue comes that uh, as far as agriculture is concerned, then we also use the word another you know, vibrant human capital. So when we use the word vibrant, I mean, what is this vibrant? You know, somebody who is very alert, somebody who can, you know, uh, seize the opportunity, somebody who can, uh, you know, quickly understand and uh, take, use all the resources to deliver it in a point. So as far as agriculture is concerned, we all know in the morning also, just now also, Chahal mentioned, about the preference of the subject for the students. One reason we always say you know, when there is a common entrance, medical, engineering and all, for people always prefer medical, then maybe sometimes pharmacy and last, agriculture. And this is one across the country kind of phenomenon, you know. But that doesn't mean that agriculture is less important, but in the perception of the parents, in the perception of the society, in the perception of the students, that is the, I mean, the kind of job opportunities or the kind of, uh, profile of the jobs they get with agriculture, they always compare with. So this is very important, you know. That means, you know, uh, the, the, the respectability of a profession is something. So this is uh, our responsibility to see that the jobs, I mean the job or anything, because as we just now said, while we respect Swaminathan, he was also agricultural scientist, but uh, we, that means an agricultural scientist can make an impact, a lasting impact. But uh, common students, they still feel. So this is the biggest gap we have to bridge. That means the profile of our profession itself is something we have to all work together to see that, uh, it, to bring it, you know, we, the first step we took is of course they declared this agriculture as a honor, a BSc honors. Now it is professional course like any other courses, like medicine, veterinary. So this is the first step. But we have to do much more. We have to do much more to uh, communicate this message that this profession is no less important than any other uh, you know, professional degree. But for this, the, the seeds have to be sown quite early. In the sense, recently I was uh, having an informal chat with a uh, very senior uh, retired engineer uh, in Mumbai, state level <laughs> officer, I asked him that, uh, do you know about Swaminathan's contribution? He, he know about Swaminathan, just name, but he doesn't know the details. You know, what, what was Green Revolution, why it is called Green what? So that means the kind of, you know, lack of, I would not say ignorance because he's a big man, the kind of lack of awareness about the subject itself among the common people, even educated people. I mean, even I think most educated people, a chief engineer of a department, if he doesn't know the exact contributions of Mr. Swam, Dr. Swaminathan, you cannot expect a common man to know. So that is because it's in, in the school level, somehow we have not been able to, despite our last efforts for many years, we have not been able to introduce agriculture as a subject. In fact, why not we have a lesson on Swaminathan's life, two-page lesson in class 9 or class 10. So that every citizen reads that what was his contribution, automatically they will also understand what is green revolution, what is white revolution. So the subject of agriculture, uh, like we read little bit about environment, we read little bit about pollution, but why not agriculture? 
Is agriculture less important than environment? Of course, environment is important. Pollution is important. But it is also equally important because it is it provides food to all of us and it is providing livelihood to more than 50% of the farmers and 60% of the agriculture laborers. So this being so important an issue, so important an area, it deserves to be taught in the schools so that at uh, the very young age, the students really, they, because what is taught in the school, we never forget. Once we pass the school stage, then we, we go into by PC, MPC, then we never learn the basic things about society or everything. So that is the one important point. Then after that, we, uh, the issue of dichotomy of, you know, actual requirement versus what we are actually teaching. Of course, the BSc agree, the graduation and all, of course, we are the typical uh, standard syllabus, we have standard curriculum, we have, and we have been teaching all over India. We have fifth readings committee, then fourth readings committee, we are revising time to time. But one point that Naren Gowda made in the morning is a very important point. What he said, that uh, while we are producing large number of graduates every year, and they are, many of them are excelling in their career, they are getting white collar jobs, some other become scientists, some other become professors, some other are going abroad. In Maharashtra, let me tell you, you will be surprised to know, I have made a survey in all the four universities in Maharashtra. Out of the uh, civil servants that are passing through Maharashtra Public Service Commission, 50% are from the four agricultural universities. 50%. So that means you just, uh, you walk to any, any department, you meet any meeting, a, a, a sub-inspector or a commissioner or a, a district guy, he will say, Sir, I am a Jambitka student. It is very good. Many of them. So that is, that is a big achievement. But on the other hand, the important point is, are these people actually serving the, the stakeholders who are actually the farmers? That's the good question. Morning also this was raised. So, if not, then what should we do? I mean, one is that my son, if he is a BSAG and if he gets a job in a bank or in a uh, in a academic institution or in a multinational company, uh, rather than any other, you know, village level or mandal level or taluka level job, I would definitely uh, prefer him to go for a a job which is in the scene, Pune, Pune, Bombay, Hyderabad and all. I will, even if I say, he may not listen to my advice. Because that is the societal pressure. That also you should understand. Being idealistic is one thing, but being uh, practical to the reality is also equally important. So, that is one thing. So, therefore, the other option is that uh, the so-called lower education, uh, the point that Pradhoda raised was, how do we address this issue of the actual farmer's requirement at the grassroots level so that while we produce the graduates uh, as an academic ex academic activity and also post graduation teaching research because we also need a lot of manpower. But at the lower level to serve in the villages to because morning we were talking about you know the skill India then uh, somebody mentioned about the because if you go to any village today the biggest uh, problems you will see two three problems one is of course water morning mention second is labor shortage of course there are many other issues then so the where are the people to advise them in terms of if there is a machine repair you know nobody can go to you know big town or city so if there is some service available within the jurisdiction then definitely the farm will be so some you know small machinery centers repairing some uh, well, well informed input delivery systems, plant clinics, there are until number of things. You can go on and telling examples. So that kind of last mile service to provide to the farmers, the, the diploma or two years, three years diploma courses which are already going on in many states. But the problem is these people also again want to come to BSA agriculture. They don't want to actually take up a job after diploma based on their diploma eligibility. Because they think that they will get stuck up in their career, they will not be able to. So this is another major challenge and this also we have to address. How do we address this? They don't want to, many people given an option they want to take BS agriculture or even sometimes they go to some irrelevant course. But they actually, they never do job in the area of their. So this is another uh, fundamental issue we have to address. I think these are very very important uh, uh, realities. So therefore, 
the issue of public versus private universities when we talk about you know when, when you start these courses and when this is the basic dilemma about the human resources you know so therefore at the policy level at the government level we have to really see that this diploma course people they really serve the stakeholders and in order to make them serve what incentives are required you know what kind of financial uh, mechanisms what kind of policy is something i think a large a large kind of debate is required so that the actual last mile service is actually provided on a continuous basis because that is very very important then the agriculture education itself is we heard dr rathod saying very eloquently it is changing over time so much so that you know earlier we feel that only it is changing every year but even agriculture yesterday i was attending a meeting in delhi called by typhac and there actually typhac is an organization which actually forecasts next 10 20 years what are the technologies that are likely to come in the country in different fields and he made a presentation the chairman of typhac is dr anil kakorkar he is from maharashtra only a very well known figure and i was uh, listening his presentation they were saying worldwide now they are telling two three very important uh, uh, finding uh, technologies which are going to make a big impact one they say is cellular agriculture cellular agriculture i don't know many of you even yesterday till yesterday i didn't even hear that word cellular agriculture means artificially producing food from their different ingredients maybe from plants maybe from in a petri dish even now uh, there are patents which produce meat from uh, plant sources exact meat with all the taste flavor everything and milk eggs so there he was saying in a in a light way light way in 2030 or 2035 or even 2040 we we may not need animals to get eat meat we may not need hens to lay eggs we may not need cows or buffaloes to lay meat to produce milk i mean that is the kind of imagination another thing he was telling is the vertical farming vertical farming you know side of uh, growing all kind of uh, things in big containers without any external influence on uh, with artificial light water minerals everything so very huge uh, you know kind of uh, imaginative and many companies are already doing so and then secondary agriculture special agriculture so many so the the, the kind of uh, Uh, you know development that is taking place and the kind of scenario that we are likely to see in the next say, 15 20 years and uh, the rapidity with which these developments are taking place this is something we also have to capture we also have to understand and we have to build in these things may not be exactly these things but i am telling as illustration we have to be you know very uh, you know uh, contemporary in terms of our thinking in terms of our curricula in terms of our teaching methods in terms of our everything we do in agriculture of course in other subject they change very fast but in agriculture also after deans committee we must appreciate icr and all other universities the way we are doing but you know unfortunately the 30% liberty given to universities that you can make your own syllabus as per your local conditions this is hardly used because it requires some effort but the university you know just to put a committee then they have to bring a consensus among the state that is not done in maharashtra i am chairman of the vice chancellor committee i could not do it in the last three years we tried our best but you know a lot of this opinion no no ye barabar nahi hai let us go for icr ka jo hai wahi le lenge koi kya zarurat hai isko badalne ka lekin when we talk to people they say sir uh, people should learn more about alfonso mango students studying in maharashtra they should learn more about little more about alfonso mango than a student in jammu kashmir a jammu kashmir person it doesn't matter no if he knows little bit about mango is fine but he should know more about temperate foods so that kind of flexibility is very well built in icr system but uh, it is not uh, you know uh, being happening and uh, as far as institutional reforms are concerned of course so uh, one thing is that you know the uh, in our own sai systems the um, uh, well uh, lot of things were said about uh, recruitment of staff the shortage of staff and uh, all these issues are to be addressed but definitely agriculture being a state subject you know we need lot of uh, you know uh, involvement and lot of uh, concern from the states 
And uh, I think at Prime Minister level itself, this issue has to be flagged in a big way. All the chief ministers that many times, many state agriculture ministers also, when you say, uh, our funds are not coming and all, but I mean, they are disowning so much. Agriculture being a state subject, education as a research, they almost disown in many states. They just disown. They say that the ICR should put you on the question and the ICR will go. ICR should put you on the ICR. I will talk to you later. 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 Actually, the issue is that it is a state subject and it is our private responsibility. That, 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 that basic message, I think, uh, at highest level it has to go. Then obviously the institutional reforms will follow because once the seriousness is taken at the highest level, obviously the resources, the reforms, the statute, act, amendment, everything will follow. Of course, it will take some time, but uh, I think somewhere we have to begin. So, I think uh, at the end of the day, the point is that uh, in terms of planning, so policy, just now policy or institutional reforms, both are required and states have to play a major role in this. Because so far what we heard in the morning, most of the initiative is taken by ICR. But states have to take a major initiative in policy as well as institutional because they are the people who actually use the outcome of this agricultural universities research and teaching and therefore they have to take it. And in this process, there is a good place both for public and private universities. Let us not see that public and private are in loggerheads. Many times there is wrong impression, but I think they can work together to achieve this goal. And uh, only thing is quality assurance we just heard in the morning and now also. So if that is assured and that is followed, if there are very good private uh, institutions also who are ready to invest. And uh, only thing is they need guidance and uh, the kind of guidance that Prathod has provided. I think if public and private institutions work together uh, on these lines, certainly we will be able to produce uh, very good human resource and along with that, if some, in some incentives and policies are built up, we can retain them in agriculture itself so that they make a lasting impact on the society in general and farmers' lives in particular. Thank you very much.
earlier we never you know see all uh, you know uh, the officers in the education division ddg and three adgs it is education division headed by ddg assisted by three adgs i have never seen all the four people sitting together any time whenever i visited for the last 20 years but now you will never see all the people separately you will always see all the four people even if you are going for a meeting all the four people will go together if you are going home all the four people will go together and that has really become a matter of concern for most most of the people in asia why is people are always together so it is a convergence program that's why government of india speaks always of convergence program and that is what is happening the convergence of north and west that rathod sahab comes from either neither north nor from west so i call north west rajasthan I come from south, and Dr. Venkateshwar comes from south, and we have a person from east also, Dr. Pandey, who is from Bihar. So there is a convergence of uh, all the directions. But earlier we had the divergence, so people from the same place, but there was a lot of divergence. Why these things are happening? Why these changes? People are witnessing and people are realizing it is because of this convergence program, and it is because of the cohesion. Which we have in the education region. That's what I, because most people may not be knowing. This is why I thought it is my duty to bring it as a person of HRD. So I thought it is my duty to bring it to the notice of everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shetty. But I think this is the best form where I should take a minute to to add something to the personality of Dr. Venkateshwar Nayar. I have worked with him in so many committees where he is there. And like all other ADGs, like Shetty, like Pandey, they are they are there, of course. But uh, whenever I have telephoned him during uh, working hour or off hours, that this meeting has to be organized, this proceedings have to be set, what we should do for next meeting, he has never said that I am busy and can't attend the call. This is very good thing. He is very positive. And whatever we achieve in committees and in the meetings, it is uh, he is at the. center of all these things to organize all things uh, once in my university he delivered one lecture to the students it was so inspiring and it's so different from his specialization and what he is working in icr it was very different lecture and student they came to me afterwards and even teachers they, they were so inspired by his lecture and were so satisfied to my to me satisfaction was only this way that i could introduce a very knowledgeable and positive person to my faculty and students and i hope dr venkatesh rulu dr thor is lucky to have many pearls in his team and this is the best team which is now i have seen working in education thank you uh, thank you thank you very much sir good thing uh, after having lunch you told all these good things before lunch i could have not taken lunch <laughs> so always uh, pleasure to have blessings from seniors very seniors and we are fortunate to have seniors and always we get uh, opportunity to learn that's more important and that is the secret behind the education division we are receptive we are together we are at the learning stage and thank you sir and uh, without making much i would like to proceed for my presentation i want to cover in three aspects changing face of agriculture academic landscape and institutional framework changing face of agriculture and agriculture education today i am standing here that is an indication that is a visible change in the face of agriculture education earlier i think many seniors agree with me we attended only meeting seminars organized by public universities public organization but very rarely private organizations have taken lead to bring together the intellectuals and this is the change in the agriculture education and this is the new thing which is happening in agriculture university across the country we have witnessed the private participation in medical science followed by engineering and this is the new new branch new sprouting in the education so absolutely this development is healthy essential to meet the capacity to meet the human resource requirement for the country as my earlier presenters made it very clearly we have lot of lot of demand and the capacity of the existing universities in public sector are not able to meet 
That is one aspect. Second aspect, lot of aspirates, young aspirates. Even I am a father of two children. How the aspirations of children to go for professional courses, higher education, it is very high in Indian context. You all know in West and America, they don't go for higher education much, the way Indians and Asians. Particularly, I think who went abroad, they see in any university, masters and PhD are the enrolled students are 90% from India and China. So our love is for education. But when we have so much love for my, our children to enter into the education, but where are the avenues? So unless the investment comes from both public and private, the aspirations of young minds will be definitely fulfilled. So today, I take this opportunity to thank uh, the Ragsoni University for bringing this particular ambience, particular this group, to discuss about agriculture education. The theme is really wonderful and once again uh, compliments to the university and that is the change in face of agriculture. Just uh, some glimpses I would like to share. Now, there are changes, everybody knows. We have made a lot of progress. Even my earlier speakers also made uh, the way technology is coming, the way the practices are coming is a completely sea change. I think I take um, the attention of uh, chief guest of today's inaugural function. Sir made few comments. Uh, then uh, I was eagerly waiting to share certain things. Sir, uh, really changes with respect to agriculture, the production, productivity, and all immense. Only unfortunate thing we are not able to realize. Really, we are not able to realize the way we have progressed. Now, as already mentioned, we are number one in several commodities. Number one in milk production. Number one in sugar. Number two in fruits, vegetables. Number two in cereals. What else we want? In major things, that is fruits, vegetables, cereals, sugar and milk, we are either number one or number two. That means we reach the maximum and that's a wonderful. Now the question is how to sustain it. How to produce human resources to manage all these things and all. So next, uh, the most important is the surging in horticulture production. Definitely, sir, earlier, <coughs> as a child, when we are students in school, if we are buying fruits, we used to get a comment, That means we eat fruits only if somebody is falling sick. Or we, we buy fruits only when we are sick. But now the changed scenario. Thanks to agriculture, thanks to horticulture, thanks to production, thanks to productivity. Today, we are able to see every, every breakfast, we are able to have menu, these fruits. And also, you also know the availability is there across the, every time. Not like seasonal. The season, the duration, it is being extended. So, we have seen very wonderful changes. Now, the most important, we are moving a paradigm shift primary to secondary. So, these are the areas, they don't need we will be able to enhance the income levels of farmers and all. So, I am changing, I am showing only, I am sharing only these things to see how the sector is changing. Just that, always we give importance IT and other sectors where success stories from India. I want to give this specific example just to realize how nicely our sectors are doing. The seafood export, why I am taking seafood? It is being considered in the agriculture a lost commodity. Main agriculture, horticulture, animal, then comes fisheries. In fishery, the export earnings are 40,000 crores per annum. But the only thing is, it is not appreciated or it is not visible. The growth, the potential, the scope is very immense. So I am not talking about the other agriculture commodities that is many more fold higher than this. And another important thing, definitely you all will be surprised to know, our fish is being exported to more than 100 countries. Today we are able to feed 100 countries with the fish. And in this exports, this is a component, there is a component of value addition, there is a component of secondary agriculture that is processing. 
mostly our exports are frozen fish. So it creates a lot of livelihood, lot of employment and all. Only thing is we need to realize, we need to respect these things. But unfortunately, agriculture means several times we only focus that suicides are farmers. They are there. But at the same time, we also should look at the availability of fruits, the availability of food grains. Earlier, starvation, everybody knows in 1950s, 60s, what of the situation. Today, we are very comfortable with a surplus. So this is the scenario. And also now we are moving slowly to smart, not only smartphone, we are moving to smart agriculture, smart uh, weather, smart uh, water, carbon smart, water smart, all the things. So we have to integrate all the technology. It is being done. It is being done in several institutions, several universities and several academic programs. And definitely our focus has to be on resilient crop varieties, enhanced nutrient, efficient usage and also comprehensive biosecurity and all those things. To achieve all, I want to mention the quality human resources relationship. So today we are all here to see how quality human resources are important to support all these uh, targets. Now that is the background and that is the changing scenario in agriculture and agricultural education. Then I will come to the landscape of academics. Already our uh, DDG sir has mentioned the programs in terms of uh, UG, PG and all. But quickly I will take, uh, so this is a global, global perception. We need to create human resources not as a job seeker but as a job provider. So earlier trend in 60s, 70s, 80s, even universities and curricula, the curricula was designed to produce graduates of agriculture science to meet, to support our department, agriculture department, how to support uh, the farmers, how to implement different schemes of the state government and central government. That was the focus. So, but now that is not serving the purpose because the numbers are high, the aspirations are high and the demands are high. So we need to create human resources who become entrepreneurs, who become self-sufficient, who become really job providers. So that is the philosophy. With the same philosophy we have developed it. So sorry for the repetition because uh, I am tempted to use this one. So this shows, this gives inspiration because the syllabus, not only, okay, we develop always, we sit and develop, but it has been released, launched by our Honorable AM. He has taken a lot of interest. He has, we have been actually pressurized from the ministry, when is the, your change is coming? So you have to create, you have to create a curricula in such a way our students become self-entrepreneurs. That is the reason entire uh, curricula has been designed with that uh, philosophy. And uh, this is already done. And always we take pride in the new system in last couple of years. Can you believe in a simple pro program? This is a student ready is an integral component of UG program. It has been launched by Honorable Prime Minister. So Honorable Prime Minister launched a program which definitely gives more pride and more confidence and more this, this one. So drive. So this is uh, driving us and the uh, only thing is still many universities are struck up with the two components that is a raw way and experiential learning. That's the one good thing experiential learning has been taken. But not only experiential learning and raw way, there are three more programs that is a student project and also a, 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 attachment to the industry and uh, uh, Dr. Vice, Vice Chancellor of Raisoni mentioned in the morning whether students will be attached to the other thing. Sir, there is an inbuilt uh, provision. In the final year, they can be placed either in public sector or private industry or any way linking to the uh, skills and uh, getting training. They, they, can, they can have the credits accordingly for the two months or four months. Or, so this will be total for one year. So there is an inbuilt mechanism to accommodate uh, whatever be the requirement for the students. Yeah, similarly for uh, all this BSMA and all, in, in this particular, uh, uh, as our DDG mentioned, uh, we have now com after completion of UG, we are on the uh, revision of PG syllabus and all. And in this entire uh, landscape, I wanted to mention, there is a definite change with the involvement of private institutions and all. So when we are talking about quality, Earlier, the accreditation board of ICR was only looking at the quality of state agricultural university. 
Now, under the chairmanship of Dr. Chair, it's so coincidental he is chairing the session I am sharing. Now, today, we are not discriminating anyone. Any university, any institution, either in public or private, either a constant college or affiliated, whether to state or central, whoever is offering agricultural education program, they are eligible to approach accreditation board of ICR and without any discrimination, we have developed a simple and single transparent scorecard system. So based on the scorecard, they will be evaluated. Whoever is meeting, whoever is fulfilling the criteria, they will be given accreditation. Not only giving accreditation, you all know, once we have all public and private, definitely there will be a competition. So we know in America every year, there will be, people will be looking, both employers and students, which, which university is coming first, then accordingly the applications will be moving in that direction. Similarly, now Indian, Indian concept, MHRD also started from last two years, and last week only they released the ranking of universities in general universities, engineering, management, and medical. So on par with that, we also started this ranking. Last year we have done ranking, and this year also we are planning to provide the ranking. So this ranking and grading and quality to infuse competition among all the players so that uh, the merit and the excellence will be generated. So finally the quality human resources can be created. So these are the efforts of uh, the quality, uh, academic programs. So this shows the landscape is so diverse. Today we have 95 specializations of master's program. That means we are able to touch everything. So there should not be any lacuna, there should not be any gap for the sake of uh, this program. And uh, very recently we completed, or uh, it is in the pipeline to develop program, academic program for organic farming and veterinary Ayurveda. Dr. Uh, Kamel Fathaksar is here, under his chairmanship we just completed the syllabus for master's program in veterinary Ayurveda and organic farming in another one or two months uh, we will be... So you all, the demand gained by these two sectors. Ayurveda is, has come up very, very big way and also organic farming. And uh, for your information, India is hosting the highest number of organic farmers in the world. But till now, we don't have any academic program to create human resources. So that is the place where ICR is coming forward to bridge or to fill up the gaps. And finally, I am going to institutional framework just to learn for both, for private and public, how this institutional framework is there and already some uh, has been covered. Just I would like to say, this entire agricultural education started from land grant college concept in, way back in 1862 from Mori Act. So you see, in 1860, almost 150 years back, US, they gave land, federal land to several agencies. Whether you sell it, you cultivate it, you end up but you start a program. They said, you see, I put it in red mark, 150 years back they told teaching of practical agriculture. Still we have that problem. We are teaching agriculture, but many times we get feedback, theoretically we are very sound, but practical knowledge is definitely needs improvement. So still things are uh, uh, there to improve upon. And after the universities of agriculture in US and the land grant pattern, there was so many universities in Europe and Australia and all. And, and also just I want to share with the uh, uh, Rhizone University, there is one Erasmus Plus program in European Union. Now, how the academic programs are being conducted? This is an example for all of us to look at. Just to look at first, then if possible, we can also start following. This is the program. It comes as a complementary philosophy. The single master's program will be offered by five universities. That means a student who gets enrolled, he has to complete five modules in five different universities and at the end he will be getting the program, he will be getting the degree. So here they are drawing the strength of each university. Many times what happens, a university they will be having very good in one particular specialization but they may not be sound in other. So they are drawing the synergy among the consortium and so this concept is uh, definitely missing in Indian context. So we can think and uh, work for that. And also 
global globalization or uh, making little uh, expanding our activities we have several programs from indian government so here looking at the strength of universities in indian context we are extending our facilities to many developing and underdeveloped countries students so iccr is leading a uh, role and inviting and extending several scholarships these are the scholarships available to many foreigners so that they can join in indian universities and all yeah edc is another agency so this this is a um, uh, interface between university and uh, foreigner country students so they will be able to provide wherever the academic appropriate programs are there and the agriculture is being uh, given now lot of importance so you can also they uh, register with this so they will be channelizing the aspirants from outside and all and uh, there are so many and one interesting example this borland higher education for agriculture research and development uh, this is uh, yeah, everybody knows uh, borland and his contribution for the food production and uh, this endowment they want to support uh, for human resource development in particularly developing countries and uh, we have got a proposal from bangladesh bangladesh students or bangladesh uh, candidates were given opportunity to take uh, masters and phd in america michigan state university but they realized the exposure in michigan state university is not able to serve the purpose of bangladesh they approached icr as everybody observed dr rathor always uh, positive immediately maybe that time 38 seconds i don't know whether 38 seconds or 20 seconds sir told immediately we agree and now the michigan state university instead of taking that they are sending to indian universities through icr for the benefit of bangladesh for two reasons one is whatever they carry out whatever they learn it is 100% relevant to bangladesh number one number two the cost wise their climate wise their uh, logistics and they don't feel they are in alien place so because of that we are gaining importance not only this today we have several programs indo africa indo afghanistan and uh, uh, sarc so many fellowships and all over them. as sir mentioned dg sir mentioned hundreds of students are coming every year and this is another potential for us another potential area for both public and private universities is not only capturing not only meeting the demand of indian we can also think globally we can also provide services to this one so as already mentioned so sorry for duplication and uh, okay always uh, this is my favorite slide uh, i want to see that many more countries to be filled by our um, fellows of uh, this fellowship is a very flagship program of icr and uh, under this uh, the students and the in service candidates a fresh anyone we don't discriminate if he comes out with a proposal which has some relevance to indian context and he has a invitation anywhere in the globe anywhere in the globe they will be offered this fellowship at the rate of 2000 dollars so this is a prestigious program and today 100 and 120 candidates are working for different aspects uh, for phd in across the globe and uh, it is a two way not only our candidates even for foreigners they can come to indian universities and complete this so it is a two way program under this netaji subhas so this is a indo africa summit it is a uh, ministry of external affairs sponsored project we are training almost every year 150 african students uh, from uh, uh, different there are there is a african union with 51 member so they sponsor candidates for our this one and in last uh, phase there are different phases we completed 195 programs so this is a pie diagram where it shows the representation of different countries who gained in terms of human resource development in our country so with this with the involvement of uh, uh, international and national with the synergy of uh, both public and private definitely we can we can fulfill the uh, expectation of our honorable prime minister always he mentions uh, india should be a human capital or skill capital of the world with this i thank you very much for giving this opportunity for the question Thank you very much, Dr. Vaishnavilu. Now we have had two very important and very knowledgeable presentation. 
Uh, now I shall request my co-chairman, uh, Dr. Yes Nanda, because we are already running short of time to have to sum up on the three, four minutes. Uh, my colleagues on the dais and uh, honorable dignitaries uh, in the respected audience, uh, a lot has been said. There won't be any repetition, but uh, I would like to make a few observations. A, that our concern that uh, most intelligent people always prefer medical or engineering or veterinary or dental sciences, then comes uh, agriculture. I don't think it's not a, I think it's not a question to, uh, a subject to worry about. As they say, bed ke dood pe saad malaiya aati hai. To dood ke malaiya nikal bhi jaya, to even then agriculture candidates that we get, they are not better. My only concern, however, is that might have been discussed several times in the education division before. The farmer and their children are running away from agriculture. Question remains, effort remains, how to attract them towards agricultural education. You would agree with me that 95 or more students of agriculture and for that matter veterinary sciences are from the elite class, from the cities, who have never touched an animal, who have not, never cut grass with their own hands. They graduate and then as Dr. Venkateshwarulu had just said, their knowledge, theoretical knowledge is very good, but they are very poor in practical. We cannot generalize though, but the fact remains that somehow we need to attract them to uh, education. Can there be some reservation or can there be some special incentives? I leave it to the audience uh, to decide further. Second question is to improve our post graduation, post graduate education, do we need to have a very elaborate uh, course curriculum? Because if you look at the course curriculum, many of these subjects which have already been read in the undergraduate program, they are often repeated with little more addition to, to the strength of the program. There are several good countries in, in the world, for example, England, UK, all four parts of the UK, they don't have any teaching program, I mean they don't have any course program. With the course program, such an elaborated course program, the students does not have enough space and time to have innovative and creative thinking. I know this has been discussed many times, this is debatable, but I still give it a call for another thinking. We all know that every rupee spent on agricultural education gives the best returns in the country. Around 16 rupees return is there after every single rupees of investment in agriculture and education. Despite that, public sector is not enough because not enough funding is coming forward. So for that matter, private institutions are a must. They are our future certain to bring agricultural education to high, even higher standards. But then there was a question as Dr. 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 said in the morning and uh, other police would also agree that a very strict monitoring mechanism need to be put in place. And my only warning to those who may be associated is as uh, it has been said in, the, said in the morning that we need an institution like VCI or MCI to keep a control. My only suggestion is that please do not follow the Council of India in total. The organization is defunct for the last three years. It has done more damage than, uh, than uh, benefits. Over the last 34 years, since its inception, only five private veterinary colleges have been regularized. And who is the, which organization is the biggest loss? The private organizations have not been allowed to enter into, into the practice. Out of five uh, private colleges, all are having more than required staff certain. But out of 35 government colleges, 20 are having 
less than 50% of the provides transfer time. And I have already made a request to uh, DDG Education that even the veterinary curriculum should be made under the uh, spices of uh, Dean's Committee in Education. I have represented, I have given it to, to the Association of Agricultural University Vice Chancellor. Let us hope that some action will be taken. With these few words, my addition to, to this delegation. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nanda. So, in this session, uh, if you open up discussion, then it means you will be washing out all the other sessions that we don't want to do. But uh, this has been decided that after all the sessions are over, we will open up this uh, uh, discussion. And kindly, please uh, go on noting down whatever comes to point your own your mind, because those are much valuable. Uh, but because of time constraint, we are arranging like this. In this session. Uh, I think uh, two or three very important points have emerged from this uh, uh, presentation. One is uh, that things remain on paper, these are not implemented and the example, best example has been given by uh, first Dr. Venteshwar Lu that 30% uh, leverage which has been given to states, that, that has the state university, that has not been implemented uh, uh, anywhere. Uh, liberal funding from the state that has been emphasized once again public-private institution and their uh, coming together that, is, that has been emphasized by all the, uh, by both the speakers and similarly by uh, Dr. Nanda as well. And then Dr. Venteshwar who made some very important point that uh, to what progress whatever in agriculture we have made to sustain this we need very competent uh, human resources uh, to, for this purpose. He has also uh, emphasized that uh, it is very important to harness the strength of each university in a synergistic form. In the morning, this point was raised by Vice Chancellor Dr. Uh, Rajan uh, Velkar. He also made this point that uh, different universities they should be interconnected, and this point is very much relevant, should be taken care of. Interlinking of universities is relatively important. And uh, particularly, I congratulate the Education Division again on one point. Again, Again, I mean that I was associated with this. I was so happy to see this slide. Uh, when we see that national linkages, international linkages, those should be uh, taken into consideration, those should be strengthened. But this uh, one thing, Netaji Subhash ICR Fellowship, uh, when we were selecting all these uh, fellows from different universities, we took two days uh, into this and uh, very, a stringent sort of interview was made where their project was uh, uh, analyzed, their, whether they have already some uh, connected, uh, uh, some uh, guide or some connections are there in those countries. But when I have seen that they are spread over whole of the globe, now this is very much encouraging and I am very happy to see this, that our that exercise which was done at that time, it has brought so much things that now our those, because those persons, they are our ambassadors, they have gone there. Those persons, they have come in there. This is real international and national linkages, which we need to, uh, of course, uh, impress upon this. With this, I uh, personally and on behalf of my uh, colleagues who are on the stage, we thank the organizers and particularly Indian Council of Agriculture Research and this university uh, for giving us this opportunity to organize this session. Uh, my thanks are due to my co-chair, Dr. S. Nanda, uh, Dr. S. Chatti, who is uh, backbone uh, behind all these programs he is organizing and he is with me on the chair also, Dr. S. S. Kanwar and Dr. Reddy uh, as reporters also. Thank you very much. The chair, uh, Dr. S. S. Chahal, co-chair, Dr. Nanda Saab and uh, the reporters, Dr. Reddy and uh, Dr. Kanwar and all of you, thank you very much. Without uh, any delay, with 80 to 89 percent marks, they are getting 50 percent reduction in the fee. That is an incentive for the students in agriculture and also one of the ways of attracting uh, the students to agriculture. RKDF University, Bhopal. So this is in RKDF University. Okay. Uh, I just uh, would like to introduce uh, the convener, chairman and co-chairman of uh, the technical session 2 on reforms in knowledge and skill requirement of agriculture graduates. The convener of uh, 
the session is uh, Dr. K.K. Saharia, who is a professor of uh, Agricultural Extension Education in Assam Agriculture University, Jorat, and more importantly, he is an honorable general body member, GP member of the ICR Society. He has been elected as the honorable member of uh, being a professor. There are quotas for various categories, and he is a member of, uh, is a GP member of uh, ICR. And uh, Dr. Saharia did his MSc and PhD from NDRI gold medal, with, uh, NDRI Karnal with the gold medal. He has guided 21 MSCs and 7 PhD students and is Editor-in-Chief of Indian Journal of uh, Extension Education, Member, Board of Directors of Rashtriya Gramina Vikas Nidhi and is the President of uh, Simanta Chetana Mancha and uh, he got uh, the best uh, paper in Indian uh, Veterinary Journal and got an award, Neil Legaroy Award and uh, several professional society awards and meritorious awards. And he was the most, another important thing is he was the director of a TV serial which ran for uh, 12 years, 4 days a week. Kalyani, in Assamese language. He has directed that uh, serial. With this uh, brief introduction, I request uh, Dr. Sarya to convene this meeting. And since uh, most people are new to other people, and I am familiar with many people, that's why I have been given this task of uh, introducing uh, chair and co-chair and that is one advantage of being in ICR. Had I been in university, probably I would have been like others also. Being in university, I know every vice chancellor, I know every dean and director and I, most people are in touch with me and many times I don't have to even look into their bio data because based on the experience uh, which I have with them, I can introduce. So with this again a brief note, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the chairman of uh, this technical session too. Dr. H.S. Gupta, probably he needs no introduction, but still it is customary to introduce. Dr. Gupta was born in Rudrapur village of Uttar Pradesh on 1st July 1953. And he had his education from IIT Karakpur, G.P. Pant University, Pantanagar, and his postdoc from Nottingham University, Washington State University. He served as head of the Department of Genetics and Plant Breeding, and he was also director of Vivekananda. Parvati Akrishi Anusandhan Samsthan in Almora, an ICR institute and uh, most prestigious uh, position he held is he, he held is a, the director of Indian Agriculture Research Institutes for a full term of five years and he was also director general of uh, BISA, Borla Institute uh, for Southeast Asia and he got several awards, national awards. The most important ones are Rajendra Prasad Award for Best Book in Crop Sciences, Haribo Mastram Trust Award of ICR, NRDC Societal Invention Award, and WPO Gold Medal, Dr. Amrit Singh Chima Award, and he was the President of uh, the prestigious society, which has more than 3,000 members, Indian Society for Genetics and Plant Breeding. He is the Fellow of Indian Society of Agriculture Biochemists, Indian Society of Genetics and Plant Breeding. He was the Fellow of Rockefeller Foundation, and the most prestigious Nasa, he is a Nasa, which was, which was speaking in the morning of utilizing the services of uh, the Nasa fellows in uh, improving the quality of teaching in agriculture universities. With this brief introduction, I, sir, I request you to kindly chair this session. And with respect to the co-chair, Dr. D.L. Maheshwar, who is currently working as uh, the Vice Chancellor of University of Horticulture Sciences, Bagalkot, in Karnataka. He served as the Director of Horticulture in Government of Karnataka for a very long period and Chief Executive of uh, Public Sector Undertaking Marketing uh, Hubcoms in the state of uh, Karnataka and uh, three performances, excellent awards in business management, expert uh, transfer uh, transactioning and then leadership uh, management and served uh, developmental programs uh, as described for the farmers and stakeholders and he has also conducting, uh, undertaken some World Bank uh, projects and uh, many other credits he has to his credit and uh, he was my senior in the college, in College of Agriculture, Darwad and I was uh, happy that he agreed to be the co-chair for this important uh, session and the rapporteurs for this session are Dr. Gangadharapa Please I am sorry, your name was not announced. Dr. Gangadharappa, who is Emeritus Professor at